say congratulations to my fellow graduates. We accomplished one of the major early milestones of our lives, high school graduation. This is a major step in the journey of our lives, one that should be recognized for its immense significance. It is an act not only of personal commitment, but also one of pride. We all worked hard to get to this point, and our work did not go to waste. But graduation is not an end goal in itself. It is instead a part of a, the larger journey of life. Life and all accomplishments we achieve during its course should be taken as starting points for further achievements. Our graduation should serve as such a launching point, projecting us to wherever our futures are meant to take us, whether we land ourselves a career, take up a trade, or continue our education at college or vocational and technical schools. All of those being recognized today share a common past through St. John's. Whether that be youth nights, mission trips, or basketball games, each of us has experienced the love and support of this community in our journey with Christ. Truly, the importance of this cannot be overstated and likely has played a crucial formative role. The lessons that we have absorbed over the years will be put into practice as we make the most of our lives and futures. Graduation has already shown us how capable we are of all accomplishing our goals when we commit ourselves to them. I hope all of us here today can take this personal accomplishment as an example of how anything is possible when we put our minds to it. As we all continue on in our lives, let us, each take, let us take each new problem on with confidence, knowing that we have achieved great heights and are equipped with necessary tools to tackle our futures. The road that lies ahead won't be easy. There will be obstacles and missed exits, potholes and roadblocks. There will be times when each of us will feel like we cannot possibly go on. There will be times when each of us will think he or she is alone, a back against the wall. But we are not alone. With God's love and each other's support, we can accomplish anything. Nothing worthwhile is easy, and that includes making the most of our futures. We will keep pushing because we know we can achieve our dreams and because we are worth it. From this day forward, let us make each decision with our best interests in mind. Let us believe in ourselves so that we may reach our goals and fulfill our dreams. Let us be the best that we can be so that we may fulfill our lives and the lives of those closest to us with happiness and with pride. We've already taken the first step by making it to this point. Now it's time to take the next step in the journey that is our lives and begin our futures. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you, Calvin, and congratulations to our graduates this morning. Would those who are able please stand for the reading of our gospel lesson? We're reading from Luke chapter 24, verses 44 through 49. Then Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And see, I am sending upon you what my father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Be God. Amen. Please be seated. So have any of y'all ever had the experience of um, reading a really good series of books as it was coming out, right? Not just stumbling upon a good series of books, but reading it as it came out. So that, uh, you know, you had to wait on that next one to get there. 
Maybe it was one of the mainstream, more popular series like Harry Potter or The Hunger Games, or maybe it was something else uh, that you were into and you were just really into that book. Or maybe you're like me and started reading the Game of Thrones series only to have the author decide to focus on the HBO show and neglect those of us waiting on the next book. <sighs> Sorry. It was my own personal little piece of angst there. Um, anyway, uh, if you have read a series of books that go together, whether you had to wait on the next one or not, or if you've gotten involved in one of the long series of movies uh, that come out these days uh, and are waiting on the next one uh, to happen to find out, you have had this experience of appreciating a really good cliffhanger, right? You know what I'm talking about, a really good cliffhanger, something that keeps you wanting to come back. You see, to me, a really good cliffhanger uh, at the end of the story like that makes you want to come back to the next book to find out what happened, but doesn't sacrifice the conclusion of the story that you're reading. That's the difference for me between a good cliffhanger and a bad cliffhanger. A bad cliffhanger sacrifices the conclusion of the story that you're reading in order to keep you wanting to come back, right? It just ends with to be continued. Um, we've seen that before, too, uh, in, in some, some of the things we watch or read. But, right, in other words, the author fully finishes the current story but leaves you wanting more. It turns out that that's what Luke does at the end of his gospel. He leaves us with a cliffhanger of a commission to his disciples. We all know about the Great Commission from Matthew's gospel, and we know about it because it gets a lot more fanfare than the commission, uh, commissions to the disciples in the other gospels. Right? Matthew's gospel says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We've heard that before. In fact, our mission here at St. John's comes from that great commission to make disciples for Jesus Christ. But Luke also offers a commission to the disciples at the end of his gospel that is a little different from Matthew's. We just read it. In Luke... Jesus roots his commission first and foremost in the scriptures. And remember here that when it says Jesus opened the scriptures to them, it means the Old Testament. He tells them everything about Moses and the prophets and the stories contained in the pages of the Hebrew Bible and how it related to his ministry as the Messiah. And then he tells them that what was written has happened his death and resurrection. And that now a change of heart and life for the forgiveness of sins must be preached to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. He's with the disciples on Easter evening in this room upstairs where they were gathered and he unfolds all of this to them, and then he tells them, and now that all of this has happened, now that all of this has happened, now that I have been crucified and raised from the dead, now a message of repentance must be preached to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. And then he tells them that they are the ones to preach that message. Because they are the witnesses to what Christ has done. He says, you are the witnesses of these things, and it's your job to go out and preach this message of repentance to the nations beginning from Jerusalem. But what Luke does that the other gospel writers do not is he doesn't have us Hear Jesus send them out to preach it. Jesus doesn't send the disciples out to preach that message from this upper room. Jesus, in Luke's gospel, doesn't send them to get started immediately. 
Instead, Jesus sends them back home. He sends them to Jerusalem to wait. To wait. Jesus sends them back to Jerusalem to wait on the Holy Spirit to come and clothe them in power that they will need to preach the word that they've been called to preach. He sends them home to wait on the Holy Spirit's power. And this is the cliffhanger, right? Because this is essentially where the story ends in Luke's gospel. We have a few verses more about Jesus ascending, and then we hear that the disciples, in fact, did go back to Jerusalem as Jesus instructed them to, to stay there and to wait. The story is concluded. It's complete in Luke's gospel. But we know there is more to hear. When did the Spirit come? What kind of power did it pour out on the disciples? What kind of message did they preach? Did people listen? Did they go out to the nations? Did they follow the commission? So many questions come to mind. That's what makes it a great cliffhanger. Luckily enough for us, Luke wrote another book. This is part one in a series that Luke writes. It's not the end. Because Luke is the author of the book of Acts. Where we hear that the Holy Spirit did come to the disciples on Pentecost. A day, by the way, that we'll celebrate on June 4th at 1030 with one service here in the sanctuary. And you're all invited. Um, Please plan to be here. To help experience the Holy Spirit once again, to experience its power among us because it came that first time on Pentecost to the disciples. We hear that in the book of Acts way early on. And they did receive the power to preach and to heal and to lead. They preached in Jerusalem and converted thousands before being run out of the city, causing the gospel to spread throughout all of the known world to all the nations. It gets preached. Luke leaves us with a great cliffhanger. Tells us about how the Holy Spirit comes to the disciples later in the book of Acts. He makes sure we want to come back and hear more. But part of what we also know is that the Holy Spirit's power kept moving in the world. Even after the book of Acts is concluded, more and more people received it. New people. People who had never met Jesus. People who weren't even alive when Jesus was alive. People who weren't Jewish. People who didn't fit the mold. It caused them to preach and to heal and to lead these new people that couldn't have possibly known or met Jesus. It caused communities to form that cared for each other, that ate together and learned with and from one another about the life of discipleship. The Holy Spirit's power kept moving. And that Holy Spirit hasn't stopped moving. From that day until this one, the Holy Spirit hasn't stopped moving. It hasn't stopped going. It hasn't stopped pouring out God's power into our lives and into the life of the world. It keeps going, empowering us to do things that shouldn't be possible for us to do. If on my uh, graduate recognition Sunday, you had asked my home church congregation if I would be standing up here today preaching, they would have laughed, most likely. The Holy Spirit inspires in us, equips us, gifts us to do things that shouldn't be possible otherwise, that people wouldn't expect from us. It helps us to form true and authentic communities of faith Communities that have the power to transform the world, to change everything through God's grace and love and mercy. The Holy Spirit hasn't stopped moving since that first Pentecost, and it has no intention of stopping moving now. 
But it's our job to be ready. Just like those first disciples. It's our job to be ready, to be waiting for the Holy Spirit over and over and over again. We know that it's moving. We know that the Holy Spirit is out there pouring God's power out into the world. It's our job to be waiting and ready to be attentive to see what it's doing and to go wherever it calls us to go. We are the ones called to preach the message to the nations because we are the witnesses to all that Christ has done. We have to be waiting and be ready for the Spirit to be poured out in our lives to see when God's Spirit is moving and to follow it where it leads us. <clears throat> to you graduates, um, this uh, passage of Scripture uh, as I reflect on it for y'all especially, we don't get to send you to college today. You have to go home for a little while uh, and get ready. This church, uh, as Calvin pointed out, has given you a foundation, an opportunity, a faith on which to build. And we know that it's there. We know that you have experienced Christ in your life Throughout these years, uh, we've witnessed that in you. And now we wait to see what you will do. We wait to see how the Holy Spirit will move in your life, how the Holy Spirit will call you through the things you will do, through your careers, through your lives. We wait to see how God will use you to build the kingdom, to make disciples, to lead the world into transformation and change. This group of graduates... Um, was in the sixth grade when Deborah and I got here. They were our first confirmation class. So I don't just say, uh, right, that we know that y'all have stood before the church before and proclaimed your faith uh, from, you know, kind of thinking that that happened, knowing that that happened uh, as confirmation. We were here and we saw it. Um, Pastor Deborah and I were here and saw you, got to see you as sixth graders, to teach you, to be a part of your lives and we are grateful for that. I am grateful for that. And to get to stand here today and see you uh, and send you home to get ready. To be ready for the ways the Holy Spirit will pour into you and give you power that you can't believe to do great things. We know it's coming and we're excited for you and to see what happens. Would y'all pray with me this day? Heavenly and Almighty God, we give you thanks for the Holy Spirit, for the ways that it guides us and directs us, the ways that it sits with us and stays with us as a comfort, as the source of peace and healing and mercy in our lives, for the ways that it draws us to you always and everywhere. God, we ask that you would reveal your Holy Spirit to us, that we would see how it's being poured out on us we would see the ways that you are sending your power to us and through us to change the world, to be a part of your kingdom building, to make disciples and to transform the world. Help us to know how to follow your call, how to know how to be ready to go when you send us. And God, we pray for these graduates that as they prepare to go into the world to do great things, that they would know the ways that you are with them, that they would always feel your presence guiding them and directing them, equipping them for the work to come. We ask these things in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who sends us the Spirit. Amen. Our hymn of sending forth this morning is Forth in Thy Name, O Lord. It's number 438 in your hymnals. Let's stand and sing together. Mm -hmm.